Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great episode of Hive Live. I'm Alex Netty, and thanks for joining us for our first episode here in 2023. Before we dive into today's topic, if you've been following us here on our YouTube channel, make sure you stay up to date with all our great approachable cybersecurity content across all our other social media channels. Be sure to follow us so you don't miss out on the latest cybersecurity news, our research, and free guides developed by our experts. Cybersecurity has been in the news a lot already this year, from airlines with Southwest to social networks with Twitter, to even the federal government with the FAA. There's been a lot of downtime and issues recently. But which of these newsmaking stories were cybersecurity incidents? And what really defines a cybersecurity incident versus just an IT event? Well, to bring it all together, I have with me today from our team, Andrew Bradley and Katie. Andrew, how are you today? I'm doing well, Alex. Thanks for having me. As Excellent. Usual. And Katie, welcome as well. Thank you. All right, guys. Uh, so the first place, um, you know, coming out of all these stories that was really uh, rubbing me the wrong way was everybody was always saying, is it a cyber incident? You know, we can't fly planes uh, due to the FAA being down. Are we being attacked by some other country? Uh, and there was a good part of me that said, I'm guessing this is probably something just IT related. But there's probably a, a fine line between the two. And I think it's probably going to help us to, to define what might be an IT event or an IT operational issue versus what's truly a, a cybersecurity incident and how we define that threshold. Uh, Katie, from your side, um, how do we kind of maybe start to draw that line and, and find a way to separate the two? So I would say there's a pretty uh, fine line between the two. There's it's a lot of overlap and a lot of gray area. There's a lot of companies in my experience who are very confused over what constitutes an incident, especially when it comes to your requirements for reporting incidents to the federal government if you are bound to that. Um, so NIST essentially kind of defines an event as any sort of occurrence in a system or network, which can include adverse events. Um, so anything that has a negative outcome, whereas the incident, they kind of draw that line over it being a violation or threat of violation of computer security policies, acceptable use policies and standard security practices. Um, so that often involves intent, doesn't always. Um, so an incident generally, in my experience, does involve malicious intent, an actual attacker or hacker getting onto a network, doing something uh, to steal data, to degrade your network, to, de uh, to harm your reputation and things of that nature. But it can also include insiders who are violating existing policies um, that causes a incident as well. Um, so again, in my experience, it's been very hard to kind of draw that line of when do we report an incident? When do we consider it an incident? Um, how do we know whether there was malicious intent involved or not, whether information was disclosed and things of that nature? Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, what are your thoughts on, on drawing that line? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. Um, I think a lot of organizations struggle with this in their own, uh, you know, planning, the incident planning and contingency planning capacities. Um, drawing the line is is something where it really takes a, a root cause analysis so if you have an event you know there's an event that's that's occurred once you dig into it and you investigate a little further whether or not it's security related is something that should should be observable in that in that root cause analysis right so if if you know like you guys are observing you know let's, let's say for example you're observing some um, some jit network jitter packet loss um, issues with people being able to access your website or application um, the root cause of that ultimately is what determines whether that is security related or security incident versus operational right so if you know your load balancer goes down that's probably operational but if it went down because it's being denial of service attacked by a, a botnet in a foreign country that's a security incident and so there's a lot of overlap in the response processes that take place and the investigative processes that take place to determine whether an event is security related or not security related um, and then the response obviously goes hand in hand you know for the security side if it's a botnet attack you got to update your firewall rules your your ddos protection mechanisms and then on the on the operational side you got to have your operational folks bring back up you know your load balancers or whatever whatever service went down um, that's impeding people from accessing your application so there's a lot of a lot of overlap and a lot of cross communication and that's why like organizations generally and this even requires this uh an overlap or a a, a path of clear um, handoff and communication between your contingency planning activities and your security incident activities. Uh, this way here, in case, you know, down the line, you, you determine it's a security incident, you can go through your security incident workflow and then reporting and all that stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's, it's a challenge for organizations for sure. And it's a challenge for people to, to really understand and, 
and, and identify where these attacks are originating or if it's an attack at all um, and make the decisions to move forward with the proper plan. I think that's a good point. And, and probably, I wonder, especially for a lot of these incidents, you know, there are those external reporting capabilities, depending on uh, what sectors you're in, what compliance obligations you have, if you're critical infrastructure or not. And probably for a lot of organizations, they do want to lean heavily on the not a cybersecurity incident, because as soon as you say that word, you're obligated to report it uh, oftentimes to federal agencies. So there's a lot of hesitation to initially report it. But boy, doesn't the news love to speculate on if it is or, or isn't. I suppose that makes it a much better story for them. Um, I think that's a, a good point through all of this and, and that idea of events versus incidents um, crossing that big threshold. Uh, I think both of those are, are good takes on it because ultimately it's the events or the initial you know investigation pieces of it that incident is crossing that threshold. But definitely, I think there's that that finer line too between uh, what is really the response part of that, and that response being: is this an IT issue? Was it a bad file? Did we just have a bad failover? Did a device fail? Or uh, through our own stupidity, for lack of a better phrase, or did somebody do this maliciously, whether internally or, or externally? Um, and I think that's a, a key piece of the puzzle. Uh, Andrew, yeah. looking at some like the controls and things, and, and we think about from frameworks like NIST or, or ISO or otherwise, there are a lot of controls, though, that do focus on some of those IT operational aspects like redundancy and high availability to try to create protection. So there is some overlap. Yeah, I mean, NIST kind of convolutes both the 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 uh, the issue too a little bit here or convolutes the the delineation, the clear delineation between operational and security incidents. So when we talk about an incident, terminology in the industry is still not common, right? So when people talk about an incident, some people are talking about operational incidents, some people are talking about security incident. That's why we're seeing like a shift right now between the terminology of incident versus breach. Breach clearly kind of identifies like an, a breach of confidentiality or integrity of information. Um, whereas like, incident is more geared towards like denial of service attacks, availability issues, even the operation side stuff. Um, NIST has, you know, I wouldn't call it clear control language. They have their their NIST language version of a clear control. And uh, and they do separate out, you know, the operational aspects, the availability aspects under the contingency planning uh, control family, stuff that requires you to have your contingency plan, your, your operational response capabilities, your business impact analyses, and your backups, like, down pat your procedures and everything to support that. But then there's also the control fit, the IR control family, and that's primarily focused on the security incidents, right? So everything we look at in the IR control family is about your response to, to malicious uh, actors or uh, not even malicious, it could be inadvertent violations of security policy, people accidentally circumventing change control, accidentally circumventing insider threat controls, things like that. Um, but the, the response that's geared towards that is more of the security response uh, and then those reporting uh, requirements that you talked about, things like reporting up to C-CERT, reporting, um, reporting up to your C-CERT, reporting up to the U.S.-CERT, uh, and other organizations and, and your customers, uh, essentially. Yeah, and, and Katie, I think too, you know, especially as we think about that uh, CIA triad for confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information, there is a lot of bleed over as we think about protecting the availability of the information, but a lot of those are maybe just more traditional IT problems. So as we talk about some of these incidents today, I think it gets even more muddy. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And we'll once we get into some more of these like news stories that came out over the last month or so, we'll definitely start to see that there's quite a bit of overlap again between the incident and then the IT operational issues causing adverse events and things as well. Uh, I love it. Let's get into it. Um, the first one that hit early this year uh, was about Southwest Airlines, um, whether through bad in investments or reinvestments in IT operations uh, or just overall aging systems. Uh, their whole system in terms of managing their airline and how it functions as a business went down. Uh, of course, that caused all kinds of flight cancellations, uh, angry passengers, and, and otherwise. Of course, at the time, uh, a flight system being down for a major airline is probably unfathomable for a lot of people. So the initial thought was they must have been attacked and, and hacked and were other airlines susceptible and it just started to run away. Eventually, it sounded like that was not the case. Uh, Katie, we can talk a little bit about kind of what we saw happen and, and some of the things, uh, the initial effects that were felt, kind of that initial event part. And ultimately it sounds like what the, the end result was there. And then we can all kind of uh, take a vote on what we think it was or wasn't. Yeah, absolutely. So um, getting, getting into how Southwest operates, they do their business a little bit differently than a lot of the other major airlines, like your Deltas, your American Airlines. Um, so 
their business model kind of uses more of a point to point system where their planes continue from one location to another to another and so on and so forth. And so when there's delays or cancellations in one part of the country, it has a snowball effect that impacts their flights and other places. Whereas these other major airlines use more of a hub and spoke system. So they all return to a central hub um, before going out to other locations, which from a general operation standpoint, sure, Southwest has a lot of success with that when there are not, you know, contingencies that they have to plan for. But when they have bad weather that causes that snowball effect, they don't have as many additional options for contingency planning, for getting their operations back up and running and for making sure that they have the staff and the planes where they need to be. Um, so that's the first part of what kind of caused this issue back over the Christmas to New Year's holiday um, is the winter storms in the Southwest of the country kind of snowballed and Southwest wasn't able to really um, kind of catch up. But the bigger problem with that wasn't that they weren't able to catch up. It was that their internal system for actually doing the staffing and finding out where the planes and the luggage and their personnel were was so outdated that it just crashed. Um, because they kept having so many delays and so many cancellations, the system couldn't keep up. So they weren't able to find replacements that hadn't gone over their, you know, um, I think it's the FAA set certain limits for how long pilots and flight attendants are allowed to actually work. So when people were counting on mandatory overtime and a lot of people were calling out, um, they weren't able to get the staff in order to meet those flight requirements. So then they ended up just having to cancel more. So whereas most of the other major airlines between Christmas and New Year's only had to cancel about 2% of their flights, Southwest ended up canceling at least 60%, um, which of course significantly impacted their passengers. Um, it impacted their staff and it's going to ultimately impact their bottom line as well. Um, all because they did not invest in their IT systems to keep them up to date and make sure that they could keep up with a lot of delays and cancellations and didn't plan for that as part of having this business model that's different to all of the other large airlines. I think that's a, a huge piece of it um, is as we think about aging technology and, and some of the requirements that we look at in the world of cybersecurity, sometimes they're seen as, as onerous, right? They say, well, we have this business process and we have a system that helps us meet it. And when we're coming in and talking about, hey, how can we do uh, stress testing on this? You know, like maybe having 50% of employees call out, does that still let the app work? It sounds onerous and, and far-fetched, but we also do the same things when we do disaster recovery plans or instant response drills. We use far-fetched scenarios to try to figure out where there are holes in, uh, you know, ultimately the responses to that. And I think all of that stuff fits into this at, at the end of the day. Um, Andrew, from your side, you know, obviously this is uh, a big focus here would be the, the availability piece, but some of that testing that we look at too in the world of, of some of these cybersecurity frameworks, I think fits in and may have helped Southwest here. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the the um, you know, the prospect of a, of a risk assessment, um, these are the types of things that, you know, NIST doesn't necessarily define a risk as specifically security in nature, right? So we, we when we do risk assessments, sometimes we account for things like, um, like, natural disasters or uh, you know unforeseen acts of God things like things like that and we take into account the likelihood of those occurring and the the potential impact and it sounds like Southwest didn't really do an impact assessment or a uh, risk assessment that covered kind of the scenario where cascading failure in their in their automated booking and 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 rebooking system um, to account for you know this type of issue. Um, and that is definitely something that is like a business risk. I'm not sure if you consider it a security risk. I'm not sure if it would end up in in your risk assessment, like as part of an RA control family requirement in NIST. Um, but it's definitely something that the business should have should have addressed from a risk risk assessment perspective. And also, a lot, I know a lot of that goes into like organizational. Uh, reinvestment, right? So reinvesting in their technology, they may have identified that their system previously was is is legacy and and you know outdated, and there might be some upgrades they need to be able to combat these types of scenarios. But yeah, a lot of it is is like a lot of that decision making that went into the point to point model um, should have been driven by a risk assessment that included this type of potential you know issue. Um, and it just seems like they they kind of dropped the ball there and didn't have that 
the foresight to do that. And risk assessments are hard, right? Because you're thinking of scenarios that could impact your business, and there's no there's no you know perfect guide for it. There's nobody that comes in and tells you all the risks to your environment. You have to think of them on your own. You have to look at your own your own portfolio. You have to look at your own technology. You have to look at everything and, and make an educated guess, basically, on what a potential risk is to your business. That happens in the security realm as well, and it seems like this is something they just didn't account for. Um, ultimately, I think uh, from our side, uh, we'll do a quick round robin on this. Uh, Katie, is this a, a cybersecurity event or a cybersecurity incident or neither? Um, if any, it would be more of an event, not an incident. Uh, and, but to Andrew's point, is it cybersecurity? Not necessarily. Is yeah. it more of a business issue? But I would say it's more of an event. I, I probably agree with that. And yeah, maybe an, an IT one at that. Andrew, your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's definitely an, an IT operational event, adverse event versus an actual, you know, security incident. And I think when we look at it from, you know, the cybersecurity perspective with the confidentiality, the integrity and the availability of data, definitely availability was impacted here. Katie, as you noted, uh, definitely reputational impact that umami of cybersecurity was absolutely impacted here. Uh, I imagine some travelers have lost trust in Southwest through that, and, and that may hurt them in the long run knowing that they have a, a bit of an adventure here from an IT perspective to upgrade. Uh, speaking of uh, upgrading systems, um, one of our perennial favorite uh, organizations that has a lot of trouble staying up to date with their IT systems, the United States federal government, uh, had one of their agencies have a large technical issue uh, that impacted all flights, uh, in fact, the most since 9-11, uh, the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, this setup uh, was a, a bad uh, PR disaster for them, uh, for many airlines as well, who had lost revenue. Of course, uh, it being a federal agency, the news was all over it uh, about it being potentially a hacking incident and maybe some act of war or otherwise. So, of course, we want to make sure we talked about it today. Uh, Andrew, you want to tell us a little bit about, uh, from the FAA perspective, kind of what happened uh, and some of your initial thoughts on it? Yeah, so the FAA relies on a system called called NOTAM, and the system is basically, or not the FAA, actually pilots and, and flight crews and, and airlines uh, around the country re rely on a system called NOTAM. And what that system basically is, it's a notice system that provides information on, on potential hazards, emergencies, advisories um, that may impact flight, flight, flight paths. So when people are planning flights, uh, a lot of the systems that integrate with um, with this no TAM system, rely on it to, to determine whether there's you know weather advisories, there's uh, things that require ground stops, stuff like that in the flight path, and it'll automatically communicate to those systems and, and tell them, hey, you guys can't you can't take this flight path today, you need to adjust it. Um, so what happened was uh, essentially there was an update to the system that was being uh, performed by a contractor, and the contractor um, kind of didn't put this through proper change control procedures. Um, they didn't do their initial testing. They didn't do the, all the things that you know are required. And FAA certainly has guidelines and requirements for, for change control, um, but they kind of did this outside of that process. And what happened was uh, it basically, uh, you know, it, it shut down the entire system. Um, so when that happens, the flight planning and flight, flight pathing tools that rely on it and the pilots that rely on it can't properly flight path. And they can't, they, there's, they have no insight into any potential weather advisories, any t potential emergencies in line. So basically shut down all air traffic that rely on the system, which is I think more than like 11,000 flights um, the day after it happened. And I think there was like 1300 uh, canceled across the US because of that outage. Um, so I know it's a perfect example of why change control is so important and testing your changes in, in, in a non-production environment before making them. Um, and so, yeah, this is something where, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it feels a lot like an operational, just, a, you know, operational event type thing, because there's a loss of availability, but, but not necessarily a malicious actor doing this, but at the same time, there's a breach of security policy and procedure here. So we have to look at it under the lens of a security incident as well. Katie, there's um, all kinds of controls in, in this and otherwise that focus on just uh, this change management, that change control, uh, as Andrew noted, you know, creating tests in uh, non-production environments, not using real data, uh, having security reviews to make sure it doesn't have impacts. Uh, in this case, it sounds like there, there was a breach from that regard, uh, which did, of course, impact the availability, but to an extent, it could have impacted the confidentiality or the integrity as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, Andrew kind of really hit the nail on the head with this one. They basically did not follow the procedures that are in place from the FBA, FAA to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen. Um, they were making changes on a live system that ultimately they deleted a file that 
was relied on by both the main system and its backups. So the NOTAM database wasn't able to pull from their backups either um, in order to make sure that they didn't go completely down while they were fixing the problem. So um, these contractors really screwed up here with um, not following the internal change control processes, not following the guidelines that were put forth by the FAA, um, ultimately having a massive, massive impact across the entire country um, for simply doing something that they they could have done in a non-production environment and completely avoided. Um, I can't imagine being one of those two contractors <laughs> who was responsible for this. Um, just just ugh, being responsible for shutting down the entire United States air traffic for, I, I think it was a couple of hours, right? Maybe maybe an hour or two and re resulting in so many delays and cancellations, um, all, all because you just didn't follow procedure. Uh, Andrew, I'll toss it over to you. Um, cybersecurity event or incident? Uh, yeah, it is a cybersecurity incident. Um, and it's mostly because the person usurped the uh, the change control process. So there's mm. a violation of policy there mm -hmm. for sure. Um, I, also, I also would point out that also maybe their contingency planning activities kind of failed a little bit because mm. they should be able to account for, you know, somebody deleting a file in production but of course it was it it uh impacted the backup environment too so yeah definitely a cybersecurity incident katie your thoughts completely agree with andrew definitely a cybersecurity incident uh, i think I, I definitely agree with that as well because you know as we think about how would i approach this you know these files are missing and the only way i probably would be able to you know get some uh ability to research and look into it more is probably treating it like an incident how did they get deleted why did they get deleted you know, and it's not as obvious as, hey, our system is down and isn't working because it's just folded under its own weight, like for Southwest. That's probably a little bit more obvious. But here, you're probably trying to figure out how those got deleted. You're probably treating as an incident, given especially, too, that the system is suddenly not working for no reason. Uh, I think at this point, you're definitely declaring yeah, that and, and having there was everybody a lot work of towards fixing it. To this investigation, right, to this uh, to the root cause analysis here, because you're starting to look, look at it from a perspective that maybe this is a nation state attack on the FAA, right? So you're looking at, you're combing through logs, you're combing through alerts, looking for anything, pseudo activity in, in log files, somebody doing something weird. And at the end of the day, it ends up being a, a, you know, a contractor who accidentally deleted a file. And that's like, you, you can never get those hours back, but at the same time, you need to know what caused this. And and one of the things that is a little bit interesting, like this this one functioned a little bit differently than most incident response investigations. Like you're doing this on the fly. They kind of knew that this was a little bit operational uh, to begin with, more of an operational issue. So this is more like an after the fact investigation than on the fly, like trying to figure out or block, you know, an attack in progress, things like that. So it was it was definitely more of like an after the fact root cause analysis and. Um, you know, in nine times out of 10, when you have that type of investigation, it's probably something internal that happened. And it happened, it just so happened that in this case, it was an internal issue. So they got a little lucky. Yeah, uh, and especially definitely, it was pretty rapid in terms of their uh, attribution for what had happened, you know, oftentimes with uh, large scale investigations like this for either companies in the critical infrastructure sector or federal agencies, you get uh, too many cooks sometimes with everybody showing up wanting to help. And sometimes there's a lot of stepping on each other's foots. Uh, so in terms of investigation time frame and, and attribution for what happened, uh, they closed this pretty quickly. Obviously, things got back online uh, within a few hours and they came out with a, a full report uh, shortly thereafter. So I do have to give them credit for all of that. And it's almost like somebody might have actually raised their hand and said, mea culpa, but you know. Yeah, that, that would be my hope. And they said it was my fault and uh, let's move on. Uh, speaking of moving on, uh, let's take our, ourselves out of the world of uh, aviation and into the world of social media um, and what's left of it. Uh, Twitter has been in the news uh, for myriad reasons over the, the past couple of weeks, uh, but most notably and recently, uh, there was some talk about a data breach. Uh, now, this is still sitting out there, and, and uh, Twitter has claimed that the, their investigation has found no evidence of hackers uh, stealing this, which, uh, you know, of course, could be disputed otherwise. Uh, there's also been, notably in the past, uh, congressional testimony uh, from former people at Twitter that have noted that Twitter has a lot of uh, outstanding issues uh, and exploitations uh, going on within their environment. So from that side, there's part of me that says this is probably true. There is also a, a well-known technique where uh, lots of folks who have stolen data will aggregate it together, find similarities, and package it up and sell it. Uh, as something that is uh, purported to be from somewhere else. So while it may not have been all directly stolen from the source, 
they can create a package of things that may all seem to be from that source. And so in this case, unfortunately, we don't know too much more about that. Katie, uh, you know a lot about packaging up stolen credentials and, and calling them an issue uh, through. Talk us a little bit about kind of what's going on in the world of Twitter right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as you mentioned, Alex, um, a lot of hackers will kind of piecemeal together things that they have stolen in the past. So even though um, recently more than 200 million Twitter profiles, including email addresses and phone numbers were posted on a hacking forum, it does look like it's a cleaned up version of the 400 million profiles that were posted back in November. And supposedly all of those profiles were obtained from a vulnerability back in 2021. So something that was um, hacked quite a while ago at this point um, that, that Twitter was able to fix back in January of 2022, but damage was already done. The data was already stolen at that point. Um, but basically back in 2021, this vulnerability in their API um, basically allowed hackers to take email addresses that had been scraped from other places um, or phone numbers, run them against Twitter and see if it matched up to an existing profile. So they were able to enumerate profiles that way um, and kind of get more details. So for example, Twitter profiles that use a pseudonym, but might use their actual name and their email address. Well, now, now the hackers have been able to kind of link that together and then package that into the profile as well. Um, so Having used that vulnerability back in 2021, scraped all that data, enumerated it, found more information and packaged that all together. Um, now those hackers are posting that on their hacker forums for sale, for use in further phishing campaigns, in spam campaigns and things of that nature. Um, so I know one article by Bleeping Computer said that they were able to verify that quite a few of those 200 million Twitter profiles are legitimate. Um, so it does look like whether or not Twitter has verified that the data was stolen from them, um, they are still legitimate. So those email addresses can be used for future, you know, um, cyber activities by malicious actors. So unfortunately, those 200 million Twitter profiles have been posted for about the equivalent of two US dollars. So not very expensive for your script kitties and your low level hackers to go buy that information and use it in their activities now. And definitely through, you know, password reuse as well for those uh, who like to reuse their passwords across social media accounts. It does create a lot of uh, exposure and sometimes packaging things up nicely uh, makes them uh, nice to buy. So it would be uh, interesting to see what will come out of that. Uh, Andrew, from your side, if, if you're one of the uh, five people who's apparently left working at Twitter, uh, how are you kind of handling something like this? Is, are you investigating it? Uh, are you dismissing it? What are your thoughts? Honestly, Twitter's got a history with, with leaking data um from their from their api and also from their front end um and in 2019 i think it was maybe 2018 i actually reported to twitter's security team that they had um been leaking information on the public front end um, so if you went to the chain uh, to forgot password page you could actually um you could actually enter the username the, it asks you either for the email address or the the twitter handle name and if you put the handle name in, it says the password was sent to an email address, but it would start out like four or five characters in the email address. But if you have that information, uh, you could go and basically scrape and figure out exactly what that email address was, especially if it's like something as simple as their first and last name. Um, so they, they're notorious for leaking information that they shouldn't have. They fixed that in like 2021, um, probably after this happened. But yeah, this is something where like right now, those people are probably thinking like what information do we actually need to store for people and what do we need to make public through our API? And there's no reason why they shouldn't have rate limiting on their API. So if somebody takes uh, you know, a pay spin of email addresses for, uh, or um, compromised email addresses from a pay spin and tries to run it through this API program to see if they can get hits for a password reset, um, there's no reason they shouldn't rate limit that. So that it takes, it at least makes it difficult for an attacker to do that sort of thing you know, in any sort of volume. The other issue there is that like, they really should make sure that um, the information that they're leaking based on responses isn't isn't something that an attacker could use to glean information from. So if, if somebody does have an account with Twitter and you're you're you know testing a bunch of comp previously compromised email addresses to see which ones are live on Twitter, don't respond with a with a resp with a, a response that lets somebody know that yes, this is an active account, right? Like it shouldn't tell them that you can reset your password or it shouldn't respond with like like 801 yes or something like that, right? It should be a generic uh, generic error message, and that's a control and NIST as well, and that's good for, there for good reason, opsec obviously, and and that's um. You know, that's these people right now are just like probably losing their minds. I know 
Twitter's going through a huge organizationally an organizational uh, reshift and or shift and and start restructure, and it's making things be more complicated. They've got you know much lower headcount now. I don't know what the security team looks like over there, but I'm sure it can't be. You know, it's it's not a great time for them to be having to deal with this, especially since it's something that was has been going on since 2021 or probably even before that. So yeah, it, it's a little bit of a nightmare for them. They've got some work to do on on a securing their API, securing the front end, and b on what kind of data they actually need to store and and what kind of error messages they need to provide for like validation. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I can just I can just skip ahead and say it's definitely a cybersecurity one, but. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, you get to go up first, uh, cybersecurity event or incident? Uh, cybersecurity incident, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Katie, your thoughts? Incident, 100%, just yep. like Andrew said. Yep. It's, Even it's funny. It... Yeah, I was going to say, it's funny because Twitter will probably say it's by design that they leak that information um, as part of like password resets or part of like account recoveries type stuff. But there's controls they need to put in place around it to, to, be, to at least thwart malicious actors from getting that information. I agree with that. Even if it's still an aggregated list of, of things from previous uh, you know, eras, it's it's still a data breach, right? Even if it's just packaged up a nice new way. Uh, yeah, if I'm Twitter, I'm, I'm at least sending out password resets to those affected users, getting some updates on credentials or, or asking them, notifying them that something has happened. Again, even if it's just a repackaged list, you know, it shows that good due diligence and, and care from the, the company. So that would be my expectation. Yeah. The other scary thing now, and not to segue to another one, because I know we, we've got other things to talk about, but the last pass breach, right? So now you can crosswalk the 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 confirmed list of Twitter accounts and then go look at the, the last pass breach data if they're the, the hackers who have the information and see if they can use that information to, to obtain the master password and get into the vaults and maybe they can get their Twitter password and now they can they know there's an active Twitter account. So there's like all these breaches end up impacting each other, all the prior breaches. Now that your information is out there, it's always out there. Hashes from from previous password breaks will always be out there. Eventually they'll be cracked. So like this type of stuff has lasting impact on you, not only from a privacy perspective, but from a potential security perspective down the line. And it's almost like we uh, put out a cool table that lets people know how quickly their passwords can be hacked. Uh, so you should definitely go check that out. Uh, spoiler alert too, uh, our new version of that table will be coming out uh, in just a couple months here. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I do want to take us uh, across the, the country, up the West Coast anyways, from that side uh, to Redmond, Washington, where Microsoft uh, this week uh, had a bit of an issue. Uh, they had a large outage that impacted uh, basically the delivery of their services worldwide uh, to all of their customers. As you can imagine, uh, many Fortune 500 and all the way down to small businesses leverage Microsoft's products to focus uh, their business operations and keep themselves moving. So without the use of uh, Teams email or anything that stores any of their files, that was a huge impact from their side. Uh, Katie, talk to us a little bit about kind of what happened at, at Microsoft and some of the initial stuff that they have shared out. Yeah, so um, they did say that they're going to come out with more of a preliminary post-incident review next week. So we'll see a little bit more about what exactly happened next week. But it does sound like they basically rolled out um, a, a new network configuration that caused a problem that made everything unavailable. So um, they, they said that the root cause is a network configuration issue. They did roll that back um, earlier this week to fix the issue pretty pretty quickly. I think, the, I think the outage lasted a couple of hours at least, um, but they were able to identify the root cause and fix it pretty quickly. But as you said, it, it did impact operations worldwide. I mean, Outlook was down, Teams was down, their Azure was down, um, and then other Microsoft products as well. So um, for a lot of these companies around the world who use Microsoft products in their business operations regularly, that's going to have a significant impact across the board for all these different companies. And it all ties back to Microsoft just rolling out a rolling out a change that had a issue in it that caused um, all of all of these things to be out. Um, so luckily, the rollback was a very quick and easy fix for them in order to kind of get everything back online. Um, but I, I do expect that we will know more details next week about what exactly that network configuration issue was and how it got through their initial change control process and made it into their live environment. Yeah, Andrew, um, kind of similar in some ways to the FAA issue, but a little bit different since this was probably more at the network layer rather than the code layer, which I think is what impacted the FAA. 
Yeah, I think the FAS was actually like a database uh, database file uh, configuration file. But for this, you know, this one is a little bit. In in the FAS case, we kind of know that there was some there was some uh, lapse in change control. We're not sure here if there was a lapse in change control. There's a lot of there's a lot of nuance in network configuration when you move from a from a development environment to a production environment. You can't account for all all the uh, the edge cases and things that could happen in that scenario because you don't have a full you know a full development environment replicating your production environment. Um, so I think here I lean towards this being a little bit more of an operational issue. They did use a rollback plan, right? So they they did have the rollback plan. This is big on rollback plans. In case you guys didn't know that, um, they used a rollback plan to to back out the change and that remediated the issue. Um, so I I think here I lean towards the operational aspect being more of more of a play operational event um, than a security issue. But we don't have enough information. Maybe when that that larger post mortem or post incident review comes out, uh, there it'll come to light that you know somebody circumvented the change control process or um, you know, it was malicious. Maybe it was something malicious. Who knows? But um, yeah, I, th I think you know what we're talking about here is is great. Is a great um, example of why NIST harps on you know change control so much and and on uh, rollback plans and testing and 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 all that all the like because it is really important. Availability is an important aspect of service delivery, even if it's not a malicious issue that that impacts avail uh, availability. It still has impact on your customers. And at the end of the day. This, from this perspective, and a lot of a lot of that's around the government being the customer. Th th as their customer, like they want you to have high availability, and you know, I think any co any customer wants you to have high availability. Your SLAs have to be hit. So I think this is like just a, a testament to like NIST has pretty good foresight here. But I mean, all the frameworks do. All the frameworks require change control. They all require you know testing and rollout and rollback plans and things of that nature. So you know, it's people. People need to focus on these things and, and really put in good processes and good controls uh, to meet those. Yeah, it's it's ultimately it's about identifying those risks, and and NIST has done a great job of this. It's about reducing the risk to businesses. Um, in the case of NIST, it was originally for the federal government, but for many private sector companies that have adopted it, uh, that framework lays the groundwork for reducing the risk for the business they do day in and day out and the data that they collect and manage. Um, so everything from the confidentiality to the integrity to the availability all the way to reputation, all of that stuff is is factored into this. Uh, and in this case, right, having good processes did cause uh, a, a problem, but those good processes also helped Microsoft recover rather quickly and, and uh, risk any further reputational harm. Uh, Katie, from your side, event or incident? Yeah, I completely agree with Andrew on this one. Unless something comes out in that post-incident review saying that someone circumvented their change control process, this one's definitely an event and not an incident. The processes were followed. It just happens to have an adverse effect on the environment. Uh, Andrew, your thoughts? Yeah, I, like I said before, I think this is an operational event. Um, the you know thinking back to the FAA one, again we don't we don't know for sure that they didn't test deleting that file, but the way the way a lot of the information that came out of it suggested that it wasn't tested before doing it. So that's the difference here between the two. And, uh, you know, Microsoft is pretty good about their security processes. I'm going to be honest, we, we worked with them in the past. We know that they've got strong security program. Um, so I, I think I'd like to believe that this is something that was more of an operational issue that they couldn't account for in test and dev um, before it got pushed to production. But we'll see. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, this yeah. is definitely the most recent of, of all the ones uh, that we talked about. Uh, in our last couple minutes, um, we'll give a, an honorable mention out to the Department of the Interior. Uh, earlier this month, uh, it was noted through an Office of the Inspector General report uh, that they had not met all of their obligations under the security controls uh, that are dictated by NIST. Uh, most notably, their passwords uh, were less than stellar, uh, including things like password 1234, which met the minimum characters uh, and complexity that was necessary for the Department of Interior requirements. Uh, but definitely was not a shining light uh, for the federal government uh, all in all. Uh, Andrew, in our past uh, lives, we have seen uh, in some of our work in working with uh, inspector generals, oftentimes they'll come in to check due diligence. Uh, this sounds like that was indeed the case for them as well. Yeah, the OIG conducted an internal audit, basically, of the security controls at the DOI. And uh, yeah, it's it's another case of where the government's very good about telling you what to do, but not doing it themselves. Um, so NIST, NIST is great. Like it would be great if the, all these all these uh, agencies and departments just applied the NIST controls as they're written. But you know, it's 
it's kind of funny. You got a lot of legacy systems in in the federal government, right? A lot of stuff that has communication issues. That a lot of patchwork, a lot of duct tape type type solutions in there. And getting things to play nice with centralized identity and access management isn't always easy. Implementing password requ password requirements on you know legacy systems isn't always easy, especially if you've got mainframes in the environment because mainframe security packages are are what I would consider archaic and don't necessarily support it. Um, but yeah, this is a, just a case where like they've got to go back and figure out like the full gamut of their of their asset inventory and what what identity and authentication workflows they've got there and button them all up for for um, credential and password security because it's kind of embarrassing that a government agency can't meet their own requirements that they set forth. And Katie, from our past auditing lives, uh, you know, in this case, we don't know for sure if it was pervasive across all of their systems. My hunch tells me that it was probably some of their systems are good and, and have good authentication mechanisms because they may be more modern. And there was probably a select few that didn't have those requirements in place and, and had the weak passwords. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, so I actually have some of the uh, statistics from the OIG report pulled up over here, but uh, it looks like they tested 86,000 different Active Directory accounts, uh, cracked the hashes on 21% of them, and close to 300 of those accounts had elevated privileges. Um, so, of course, that's very concerning, um, but even more so than that, it looks like they weren't really using multi-factor authentication either. Um, so 25 out of 29 high-value assets were not protected by multi-factor authentication. So um, having worked for the government, not terribly surprised, unfortunately, but um, working in the cybersecurity industry, definitely very disappointed. <laughs> um, but um, especially with just how often the government harps on multi-factor authentication in particular, and how many NIST controls are specific to multi-factor authentication, and how even multi-factor authentication in a lot of cases isn't enough on its own anymore. <laughs> and um it's just it's sad to see that the department of the interior is really not following their like not practicing what they preach i guess is the best way of putting it um but i i it's definitely just very disappointing to see this um and then and then of course 362 of those accounts also belonged to more senior level employees so lots of lots of disappointing statistics coming out of that. Um, and again, coming from an auditing background and the cybersecurity background, really disappointed to see that, especially knowing that they are hosting federal data that working for the DOD, we were trying so hard to protect. When you're not protecting it yourself, how are you going to expect your contractors and your third parties to protect it as as well? Yeah, definitely um, disappointing from that perspective. Uh, it doesn't quite fit in our, our mold of the rest of our conversation for event versus incident, uh, but I suppose knowing that some of those passwords were weak, it might require a little extra scrutiny or maybe some background investigation to see how things actually fleshed out uh, at the end of it. Yeah, I mean, we talk about advanced persistent threats all the time. If you've got a bunch of privileged accounts for high value assets, and by the way, high value assets are like financial, like financially significant systems or systems storing either you know state sensitive data, government sensitive data, or um, healthcare data, um, HIPAA, HIPAA protected type stuff. That is kind of it's kind of embarrassing, right? Like this is stuff where because all these privileged accounts had such weak passwords that there could be other nation states living in the system. And and just uh, taking all this information and the fact that there's no multi-factor authentication on there is is a little strange, right? Like I get it, we get it. We've all worked at the federal government. Their their organizational structures are very disparate and not decentralized, but very disparate. So you've got basically little companies inside of the bigger Department of the Interior that all have to account for their own security control implementation. So it gets tough, but at the same time, through the government, they're supposed to be the shining example. Uh, I agree with that as well. Uh, on that note, uh, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank Andrew and Katie for joining us. Uh, I think one of my key takeaways from today is that uh, gray line that exists between IT incidents uh, or cybersecurity incidents and IT events. Uh, hopefully this made a little bit clear about the next story that you see in the news, uh, whether it's truly a cybersecurity issue or not. We hope you'll share this episode with your friends and family who may have heard about these stories in the news as well, but missed out on the crucial context of what truly makes up a cybersecurity incident. We also want to thank you for joining us as always, and our experts here at Hive Systems help make your cybersecurity journey more approachable. So please reach out to us anytime by contacting us at www.hivesystems.io. 
Before we go, make sure to subscribe to our channel so you can be alerted about our next episode by going to www.hivesystems.io slash hive live. Next month, we'll tackle another great cybersecurity topic, so make sure you don't miss it, again, by subscribing to our channel at www.hivesystems.io slash hive live. Until next time, when it comes to cybersecurity, remember, you need to act and not react. Thank you very much.